Okay, so this is the brief audio review for A Theory of Genius. Okay, so personally, I think this reading is super interesting. Just the kind of way he breaks down genius. I think it's pretty genius. Haha. <laughs> okay, so first he talks about the relationship between genes and genius, right? So um, by using examples of great musicians who came from families with musical talent. So this leads a lot of people to kind of assume that we inherit our, our inherent, inherit our talent biologically, right? But family inheritance has both a biological and a social character, so it's very difficult to separate those things. He argues that it's not just talent that a person needs in order to become a genius, or, you know, for example, if you're still using the musical talent example. It's also self-esteem that's necessary, and we'll get into that in a bit, right? He really goes in depth into that. So he talks about how, you know, language in general, if you really think about it, is a pretty amazing human achievement. It's so complicated. It's really amazing we can do it, right? Words are complex and can often have many meanings. So how do we know that people are interpreting the word the way that we think they are? How do we know which meaning of a word a person is using, right? And of course, metaphors and idioms make this way more complicated <laughs> as you know if you've ever tried to learn English as a second language then a lot of those idioms are taken for granted and just really don't make that much sense um, they're kind of bizarre so this really complicates language even more so using language correctly is a very creative process so he argues that creative intelligence is, is the basis for genius and it's really the ability to find a new way or a new solution to an old problem so he uses physics as an example, right? That classical physics was inadequate for explaining the universe. And so many great thinkers tried to apply these principles in a larger scale or scope, but they couldn't break through to create a unified theory that could explain both quantum physics and the physics of the cosmos. So Einstein was able to make a breakthrough with relativity because instead of using the same old solutions, he thought outside of the constructs. So again, there were other people that were more acclaimed or more academic or, um, you know, had, had done more research on the topic that, you know, it would have made more sense for them to make those breakthroughs. But because they were using the same kind of constructs and conventions, they weren't able to think outside of that. Basically, Einstein said, well, if these rules aren't applying, then just scrap the rules and try and understand the universe and how that works instead of trying to fit it inside of a theory that you already understood. So it's pretty rare for people to have those kind of innovations in many ways. Uh, but when it comes to language, pretty much every person is a genius by the age of five. So he really asks this question, like why is it that we are geniuses at language, but not in all the other ways or all the other things that we encounter in our lives? And you know, this, so, so many of us um, are so creative and thoughtful when it comes to language, but not so much with other things. So he attempts to explain this with the suggestion that the method of instruction might be a key part of why. So he assumes the capacity for creative genius is there in all aspects of activity, not just language, but you know that if we're gonna talk about it being genetic, he argues that we genetically inherit the potential that we have, right? And he uses the evidence that how complicated the brain is and how powerful it is to kind of make his argument. Basically saying that we have this potential, why is it that that potential is not developed? So he talks then about, kind of at length, <laughs> some of the characteristics that differentiate language instruction, as he thinks that might have a key factor in why it is we become geniuses with language but not other things. So he talks about the five ways that language instruction differs. So the first is exposure, meaning that um, you're exposed to language at the moment of birth, and then it happens constantly after that, right? Um, unless you're in those you know, extreme cases of isolation we talked about before, we are exposed pretty much immediately. And actually, interestingly enough, we're actually exposed in utero, right? Um, that's why babies will often know the, the voice of their parents, right? Because they hear them. But again, this idea that we are exposed to language immediately and constantly, that's a big part of the exposure. Um, it's interactive. So language instruction is interactive. Um, the only time it's not that way is when you're an infant and you're just kind of passively sitting there like blah, 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 and people are like talking at you. But the rest of the time, it's pretty interactive, right? So 
it's not something where you're just like sitting in a room and <laughs> someone's lecturing at you and you write stuff down, right? It's a very interactive process. So the next part that he argues is that there's also the language tutoring, as he calls it, or just like learning language, is done by those who are extraordinarily competent in the subject that they're transmitting. So, you know, if you have an adult talking to an infant, clearly the adult is like a million times better at language than that infant. So it's having someone not just that's like good at it, but extremely good at, you know, that particular subject is important to whether or not or how well someone develops by learning from that person. Um, another aspect of this was spontaneous impulses and gestures. So he argues that language is built upon spontaneous participation of kids. So most other things we learn, they require the learner to conform in some way to the conventions of that subject. But, you know, language is different. Like kids say words and we encourage them or sometimes they say it wrong and that becomes like an inside joke or, you know, um, that the kids don't have to conform to a specific type of speaking. It's something that they kind of freely develop, right? It's spontaneous. And we, we typically affirm them when they do it like, good job, yay, or, you know, yes, that's a cat, or things like that. So language can affirm their sense of self. And because it's basically the part where you're reacting to their impulses and gestures, right? So, you know, everyone likes that, being responded to, being listened to. So this means that it affects their self-esteem. And in, in this whole chunk of the reading, he talks about Montessori school and how it is an interesting concept, Montessori schools, because they're basically trying to apply the same kind of spontaneousness of learning um, to a more, you know, uh, school subject kind of thing, like having kids play with math or play with these kind of things, right? Which can be very valuable because again, it, it fosters more creativity of thought instead of the kind of like structure of memorizing multiplication tables or <laughs> things like that, right? But um, the problem that he argues is the exposure factor, meaning even if a Montessori school is like really, really good, you have to wait until the kid's old enough to go. So you have to wait till they're like five years old. That means already you've lost a lot of potential right there. And then the fact that Montessori school is only going to affect them for the hours they're in school versus exposure to language is constant. Like, it's not like you go home and now you're silent. <laughs> no one talks to you for hours, right? So, um, you know, those Montessori, Montessori schools can be valuable in that kind of a way of, you know, relating back to the more interactiveness and, you know, competent tutors and kind of giving the kids creativity. But at the same time, you know, you're limited because you're, it's, the exposure isn't there in the same kind of way. Um, also, um, relating back to the Montessori's, the last point, the response to the learner's progress, meaning that if some random teacher that's kind of a stranger to you responds to your progress, you don't really care, right? But if someone that's like your parent or someone you really care about the most, they respond to your progress, that's going to reaffirm you more and help you learn. Okay, so then he talks about this concept of the real and the false self. So he really gets into this long explanation of self-esteem and its relationship to genius. So I will kind of narrow that down. So first he says that these things are linked and the author uses Emerson's arguments that we all have the potential for brilliance. But, uh, you know, and part of this is having an accurate perception of reality which is an aspect to genius, but at the same time, it's, it's more about pushing past conformity to popular held versions of what's real and what's possible, meaning that what is possible tends to blind us from our own inner visions of genius. So the people that can break through are the people that have very high self-esteem so that they can withstand the social rejection that might come as a result of looking past what reality shows you know, the popular held version of reality and seeing a more accurate perception of reality, right? Like another example we talked about earlier in the class was um, Copernicus, right? Trying to say like, maybe the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around, <laughs> right? Um, the reason he was able to do that was because he looked past the popularly held versions at the time and the kind of theological notion that man was the center of the universe, um, you know, that this is kind of a God created thing for specifically man and you know, the rest of the universe is kind of whatever. Um, 
So as a result of looking past that, I mean, you have to have pretty strong self-esteem to deal with the consequences of those things. Like Copernicus, people weren't like, yay, what a great idea. Like they hated him for it, right? And a lot of people that make those kind of innovations or push past what's considered appropriate don't necessarily get the recognition in their own time period for just how genius they are. So he talks about Emerson and his all, uh, you know, uh, philosophical understandings of this, you know, idea of brilliance and intelligence and, and um, genius. And then he talks about Freud, um, who really looks at our thoughts and how thoughts affect us. And so really both of them are teaching that a lot of our thoughts are unsolicited and nonverbal, meaning that they just appear and they seem to disappear in an instant, right? Like sometimes you get it like a flash. Right, um, which is kind of the worst when sometimes you get one and you're like, oh, what was that? That was great. Like I literally had one where I was like, oh, I just thought of an invention that would make like so much money. And then it was gone. <laughs> I was like, no, right? That those flashes can happen. It feels, you know, instantaneous. So our first thoughts are those ones that are unedited or uncensored by our social constructs. And both Emerson and Freud, and of course the author here are trying to argue that those are the ones we should trust because those are the ones that are kind of the pure genius. So back to the connection between self-esteem and genius, um, it's not talent that separated genius, it's, it's self-esteem. All right, so then he goes into this whole thing about self-esteem and, and guilt and shame. So he says that self-esteem rests upon the management of shame and guilt in combination with the development of talent is what really gives rise to genius. So he goes in this whole concept of a shame construct and how shame works and it's long, but I'm going to cut it down real short. So <laughs> basically he talks about guilt, which is produced by the possibility of injuring another person. So like if you forget someone's birthday or something like that, you could, you could hurt them and you tend to feel guilt, um, you know, in those moments when you feel like you're going to hurt another person. And, but at the, at the same time, feeling guilt yourself, um, might experience, you know, um, like if you're basically, your self is still intact, right? Versus when you're experiencing shame, we feel a disintegration of ourself, right? And guilt becomes like, he calls it more uh, prestigious, which I thought was an interesting way to look at it, um, that some people are actually prideful of their guilt because it shows that they're moral people that have intact selves versus, you know, shame is one of those things is so intensely painful. He says it's probably the most painful of all feelings that each person spends so much time constructing a self that the threat of losing that self can be more painful than the threat of dying. Meaning, you know, and he uses the example of how, you know, throughout time, throughout cultures, there's a lot of situations where people will kill themselves because they've been socially shamed, right? Um, and, you know, and then he goes into this whole thing about, you know, so obviously the painfulness of it is what, you know, is so a strong motivator of it, right? But then he goes into this whole idea of shame being ubiquitous, which just means more like pervasive, right? So he says that in children and in adults, this can actually be kind of invisible. But then, it has, then he asks a question like, how can you be plagued by shame but not even know what's happening, right? And so then he goes into this whole thing about how there's two paths that people take in order to avoid noticing the feeling of shame, that they have, uh, they bypass or overt, or I mean, they have bypass the shame or they um, go towards this overt, undifferentiated shame. So bypassing is just to swallow the pain, right? So your pain decreases dramatically, you know, up front, but the duration of the problem is increased a lot because it becomes an obsessive ideation or speech. Like you start to experience a very little feeling while compulsively thinking. So he says that the bypassing has way too much thinking and too little feeling versus the overt or undifferentiated shame, which is the opposite, right? It's too much feeling, too little thinking. So you've experienced overt, undifferentiated shame. If you've ever felt embarrassed, humiliated, mortified, right? That's kind of the, the feeling reaction to those social understandings. So he argues that shame seems to be the stereotypical emotional response to a threat of loss of connection, right? To other people. And when we become embarrassed, or lose face in public when we're caught in a lie or if we fall for an obvious trick or something like that, that, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a showing of our overt, 
um, experience of shame. But in bypass shame, the social source is often less obvious since the experience comes about when you're alone, reflecting on a moment over and over in your head. Like, you're like, oh, when I said that, what did they think about that? Or like, I've, I've done this with like job interviews where you're like, oh, when I said that thing, I'm not sure how they reacted to that, right? Where you play the thing over and over in your head. So it's not necessarily in the moment when it happens. It's later when you're thinking about it so much. So anywho, he goes back to this whole idea of, you know, emotion and creativity. And he talks about this concept of the feeling trap. So he explains emotional states that are virtually lifelong. He says that feeling traps occur when someone has an emotional reaction to an emotional reaction and another reaction to that emotional reaction and so on and so on and so on. So meaning being ashamed of being ashamed, right? It becomes a spiral, one that results in all sorts of different ways. And one of the examples he gives could be stage fright. Um, which can paralyze a person's mind and body, right? So um, he talks about how this affects interpersonal relations, that, you know, there are these lethal feeling traps that seem to be, you know, like the, the shame rage spiral he talks about, which is just being ashamed that you're angry and then you become angry at yourself. And then humiliated fury, which is just when you have anger that's directed at another person rather than yourself. So, but that anger is still really bound up in shame. But the interesting part of this is how do you escape it, right? If you're in this spiral of anger and shame and, you know, feeling terrible, how do you escape? So he says the most common way people attempt to escape it is to talk themselves out of it, which rarely works, <laughs> right? In psychotherapy, they encourage people to express or discharge their anger, right? Um, terrible example, because again, this is not timely, but uh, if you saw you know, First Wives Club or any of those ones, any of those movies where they basically show couples counseling, that's always one of those kind of, uh, you know, things that they, stereotypical things that they have, these little bats you hit each other with or so you can express your anger, express how you feel about whatever. Um, I just think uh, Diane Keaton in First Wives Club does it fantastically. But anyway, it's because she's fantastic. But um, it doesn't tend to work right this put displacing that anger because it ignores the shame component is what he's arguing so he says people become embarrassed when they're trying to show anger because they're not really angry and that's again first wives club you'll know what i'm talking about um <laughs> he says that the really laughter can relieve embarrassment right if you laugh good naturedly when shame is evoked it can be quickly dispelled <laughs> i have a personal example of that um i remember in undergrad at Fullerton College, um, the community college, I was running, you know, just kind of sprinting from the parking lot late to class. I was worried about getting there on time, kind of just in the hustle. You're all in your head. You're not really like even in your body at the moment. You're just kind of going through the motions. And I just ate it, like just slipped, fell, landed on my face so bummed, so pissed. <laughs> just talk about humiliation, shame, etc. And then I noticed that why I fell was because I literally fell by standing and slipping on a banana peel. And then I started laughing so hard because it was just so like, it was just so on the nose. Like it was just so <laughs> like ridiculous. That it's like, oh, how'd you fall? Oh, I slipped on a banana peel. Like it just, it's like, I'd only ever seen it in movies, but never in life. And I, it literally happened. Turns out that's a, that's a real thing. You will slip on one pretty bad. But anyway, um, just ate it. Like just <laughs> ate it bad. Like, you know, I like scuffed up my jeans. I like cut through my hand. Like it wasn't great. But then I just was sitting there on the ground cracking up. Right. So that's kind of what he's talking about, about dispelling shame with laughter that, you know, when we feel humiliated, sometimes we'll hide our feelings by like covering our face or trying to leave, right? And this can be the beginning of a feeling trap. And it's really common to be mad at the people that you perceive to be shaming you. But if you laugh immediately, and he says not laugh like, ha ha, look at me, right? But good naturedly, like, and I think what he means by that is just that like internally, you actually find it funny, right? And you're not the butt of the joke as much as you can see the humor in the situation like like slipping on a banana peel when you're late right um so if you can laugh right away you can avoid entry into that negative spiral all right so the laughing genius he again talks about self-esteem kind of bringing the whole thing back together so he says that th there's two paths to self-esteem the first is through experiencing less humiliation <laughs> 
Um, so meaning like if your life is just like great somehow and you've never had to be humiliated, then you don't have as many shame spirals, <laughs> right? But the second path is developing ways of managing shame, which obviously is far more important in the development of self-esteem than how much respect you're treated with because that can always change, <laughs> right? But if you've developed those management tools, those are there for life. So when it comes to shame, it's something we want to avoid like the plague, but it is unavoidable. It's part of life. And he talks about love as an example that <laughs> obviously we all experience rejection at some point or, you know, love can be something that's really fulfilling or it can be something that's extremely frustrating. Um, then oftentimes shame can come about because of those things, those kind of normal social processes of relationships that we grow into. So he has this laughing hypothesis. So he basically talks about like Nietzsche, and a couple other people, he basically makes this example that uh, it only took him 30 days to write Zarathustra, right? That um, some creators, he say, are just easy creators, meaning that um, they have rapid creativity, like only 30 days to write a book that's considered like very important to, um, you know, philosophy or, or, you know, kind of Western philosophy is pretty impressive, right? So he says that... Um, the reason that these kind of people can create so quickly like this is because they have a freedom from self-censure and you know but again the idea that it, it's because they're laughing all the time is kind of difficult to test because it's not like there's a bunch of memoirs about how often like Nietzsche was laughing and if you read his readings it doesn't sound like he was laughing that much but anyway <laughs> they're kind of they're kind of dark but anyway um but again his hy hypothesis is pretty interesting this idea that maybe it's because they're have such high self-esteem that they don't look at themselves negatively that they're able to create without all that kind of crap that gets into your brain that self-sabotages you right so then he brings the whole thing together and says that creative intelligence may arise out of two interrelated processes meaning the development of talent and the growth of very high levels of self-esteem so he argues that in order to produce more geniuses, we need to create a model of instruction that's like language in our first five years. And we need to develop high levels of self-esteem so we can have freedom from chronic shame, which is that invisible shame that we don't notice that caused those feeling traps. And he suggests that by having good natured laughs at our own expense, we can often disarm those feeling traps and get past those emotional blocks that affect our ability to become geniuses. 